some announcements on the back of the bulletin, some of the usual ones, Tuesday, Monday, tomorrow, 6.30 Boy Scouts, Tuesday, 6.30 Cub Scouts, and Wednesday, 6.30, <coughs> excuse me, United Methodist Youth Fellowship. We have an extra meeting this week, finally, on Friday at 10 a.m. The Disaster Response Committee will meet. Uh, and next Sunday sermon title is God's Promises Have Strings Attached. And dates to remember, they're collecting school supplies for Bethel School now. And uh, well, the pastor's Bible study is still on hold. I was, uh, just stay tuned for further developments on that. Yes, ma'am. Uh, okay. Did everybody hear that? No. Finance committee meet, we needs to meet Wednesday at six to go over the new budget. How long? We're adjusting the, not the sound level this morning, so bear with us. <laughs> okay. Uh, those of you that are on the, it's the old nominations committee. It's the lay leadership committee. We're going to be meeting up here on the September the 11th. And I'll, I will send you out, or I will contact you and let you know. September 11th, I think at 10 a.m. Uh, doing that and for as far as this Friday for those of you that are that want to be on the disaster relief committee we don't have a committee as of yet anybody who wants to serve on that is certainly welcome to come Friday morning and be a part of that so that's that okay. Okay, I believe next Sunday we will have a fellowship breakfast since that will be the first Sunday of the month. <coughs> and everybody's invited to that. Oh, is, is Jim cooking? Jim's cooking, Jim Jenkins. That, that generally says we're going to have some pancakes, <coughs> among other things. Yes, ma'am. Okay, we're having a craft show November 7th. If anyone wants a booth or knows someone that does, have to contact me or the church. Okay. Craft show is scheduled for November the 2nd. If you know if you like a booth or know anybody that does, have a contact hand. Yes, ma'am. We have some pharmacy benefit cards that have been sent to the church. If anyone would like to try one, it is for the underinsured and those in the Medicare credit gap. So if you know anybody that fits that and would like to try this card, it is not an insurance card, but it helps with out-of-network drugs. Okay. Any other announcements we have? Anyone like that? Has anybody had a birthday or celebrated an anniversary? This is the 14th Sunday after the Pentecost, and as we prepare to go to the Lord and worship this morning, would you bow with me in prayer? Lord, this is indeed the day, that, the day that you have created. So let us rejoice and be glad in that which you have given to us. And as we worship here this morning, may we feel the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit as you speak to each of our hearts. For this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Our call to worship this morning is number 64. Holy, holy, holy. Let's stand at... Sing together, number 64.
join me as together we affirm our faith in the Apostles' Creed. <coughs> Let us say what we believe. I believe, I believe in God, God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under the mighty Pilate, and was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From the end he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Good to see you all this morning. You know, I have trouble getting up from here. And if you've noticed, I've had a little trouble sitting down here. Sometimes my knees just don't like to do what they're supposed to do. And I have a little trouble walking sometimes and climbing. I can't hardly do anymore. And you know, there's several people out here in the congregation that have a little trouble moving or standing up straight or walking and some of us have had it for a long time and some of us haven't had it for very long well in the bible there's a story about a woman and for 18 years she had not been able to stand up straight she was always bent over and you know that's a long time to go and not stand up straight. That would really make your back hurt, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. If you had to go all day long for 18 years. Well, Jesus saw her, and he touched her, and he made her well. And boy, was she one happy woman. She was singing praises and, and thanking the Lord and everything else. Now, this was on a Sunday, and the leaders of the synagogue, that's what the, the Jewish people call their church, is a synagogue. And the leaders in there got really mad. And they told Jesus, said, you have six days to work. On God's day, you are not supposed to do any work. Now, I wouldn't have considered that work. I would have thought it was a blessing, you know, for that lady. But they got really grumpy about it. And Jesus looked them in the eye and he said, you know, he knew that on the seventh day, that's your day of rest. But he also knew if there's an accident, say you've got a, a cow or a goat or something and it falls in a deep ravine or a deep hole or a deep ditch, and, you know, it's really a danger for it to be there. Even if it's a Sunday, they were allowed to pull it out. Except they didn't have cows, they had oxes. And so Jesus told them, said, You know, I know that if something happens to your ox or something like that happens, you're allowed to take care of it on a Sunday, and it's not really considered work as such. You know, but here you're fussing at me because I made a woman well. Because she feels good now. And she's singing and dancing and doing things she hasn't been able to do for a long time. And the people listened to Jesus really careful, carefully. And they were, it made them really happy that 
Jesus did that. And when he had told them all of this stuff, the leaders of the church felt bad because they realized that what he had done was not exactly work. It was really a great blessing. And the crowd that was around them all, all the people that was in the, the synagogue, they were rejoicing at all the wonderful things that Jesus was doing. And you know, he he does wonderful things for us today still. We may not see him and he may not look us in the eye and say, okay, Laverna, your legs are not going to hurt anymore. Uh, you know, that may not be the way I'm going to be healed. But one of the greatest promises that Jesus gave us, that no matter what is happening with us, whether my, uh, it's because I'm in pain with my legs or whether you're in trouble at school or you skinned your knee, whatever happens to us, Jesus does not leave us alone. He is always, always there with us, even though we may not see him. Sometimes we can sure feel him, though, and be thankful for to him. Let's say a little prayer. Thank you, Jesus. You love people so much that you wanted to do good things for them like healing this woman who had been bent over for 18 years. And thank you that you love us so much that you are still doing good things for us. Help us to remember whatever's going on in our lives. You're right there with us. In the name of our Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. know about the knees. That's why when you have me, when you see me do that, I don't sit on the kneeler. I sit on the rail. I don't get up that well. Joy is today. Joy is that you want to share today? Okay. Speaking of knees, I had a little pain injected in my knees. It was terrible. I could walk much better. It hurt. Also, Yeah, yeah. 
come to you on this beautiful day that you have created. We know that all good things come from you. But Lord, there are times when we deal with bad things in our lives. Times when we deal with things that are unpleasant. Times when we deal with hurts and frustrations and anxieties and fears. And we, we know, Lord, that you don't create those things. That in our efforts to strive to serve you and to do your work and fulfill your will, we know that there are times when interference from the enemy comes into our lives. So, Lord, we pray this morning that as we strive to serve you, we strive to fulfill that. You will give us the courage, strength, and the hope to endure and to overpower 
the negatives that come into our lives. So this morning, Lord, I want to lift up each one who is here today. Whatever it is that lies on their heart today, a joy or a concern or both, Lord, I lift them into your care. Because we know, Lord, that not only have we experienced hurt in our life that we probably will again. Tomorrow or a week from now or a month from now or a year from now, whenever it comes, Lord, we will experience it. So Lord, help us to have strength. And also, Lord, we lift up all those who are not here today. We lift up those who are suffering, who are at home or in hospitals or, or in nursing centers those who are serving our country around the world, in the military and, and as diplomats and ambassadors, those, Lord, who are traveling. We lift all of these into your care, into your love. Especially those, Lord, who are away from their families for whatever reason. We pray for their safety and we pray for their families. Lord, the, the names that we raised to you, the hands that went up, those are needs that you know about, but you also want us to bring those things to your attention. So, Lord, we've done that this morning. We bring to your attention all those who are hurting, all those who are suffering, all those who are in sorrow, all those who hurt, whether it be a spiritual hurt or a physical hurt or a financial or an emotional hurt, whatever it is, Lord, I pray that they will turn that over to you this morning. Because when we trust in you, and believe in you, Lord, that's when things turn around. Instead of telling ourselves we can't, we say, yes, we can. So, Lord, we just pray for strength today. And, and also, Lord, as we come in your presence today, we know that we've not always acted in ways that we should. We've not always been the children that we should be. We have lashed out at others through anger and frustration, and we've even lashed out and blamed you sometimes for the things that happen to us. And because we feel like our lives are so full of ourselves, we don't spend as much time in your word or in prayer with you as we should. So Lord, today, during this time of worship and in these moments of prayer, let us slow down and stop and take a look at our lives. We need to make some changes today. We need to spend more time with you I pray that we can do that. I pray that we can make those adjustments today through your help. That we can turn our lives around and turn our paths around. For all these things, Lord, we lift up to you. As we seek forgiveness and love and grace and peace. We seek these things and pray these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught each of his disciples to pray together as we now as a church family pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever.
brought us all things that are good into our lives. And now let us share that goodness and that love with you. As we give these gifts this morning, Lord, we pray that as you bless them, you will use them as good is created, as joy and peace are brought into the world. We ask this in Jesus. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the desolate pit, out of the miry bog, and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear, and put their trust in the Lord. Happy are those who make the Lord their trust. You do not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after false gods. You have multiplied, O Lord my God, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts toward us. None can compare with you. Were I to proclaim and tell of them, they would be more than can be counted. Continue our readings in the New Testament from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 13, verses 10 through 17. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and just then there appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for eighteen years. She was bent over and was quite unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. When he laid his hands on her, immediately she stood up straight and began praising God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, There are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured, and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, You hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger? and lead it away to give it water. And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for eighteen long years, be set free from this bondage on the Sabbath day? When he said this, all his opponents were put to shame, and the entire crowd was rejoicing at all the wonderful things that he was doing. The word of God for the children of God. Thanks be to God.
try this again. Okay. There was a story about an older woman, very religious woman who lived in a home on a street on a block, and next door to her lived an atheist. And the woman would go out on her porch every morning and say, Praise be to God. God loves me. And the atheist would go on his porch and he would say, There ain't no God. There ain't no God. And this went on and on and on. Well, this lady fell upon some hard times. And so she stood on her porch and she said, Lord, I know you're going to take care of me because you love me. Praise God. I need some groceries. I need some food. And the next morning on her porch, she found two bags of groceries. And she stood on her porch and said, Praise God, you took care of me. And the atheist jumped out from behind the bush and he said, Ah, I told you there ain't no God. I brought you those groceries. And she said, Praise God, thank you God, you not only brought me groceries, you made the devil pay for them. <laughs> Dr. Fred Craddock, who is now an international <laughs> evangelist, Actually, at one time, a former Methodist pastor in the Oklahoma Conference and actually taught in the seminary up at uh, Phillips University in Enid when I attended there in 1976. Um, from there, left and went to Emory University in Atlanta as a teacher, and now he is an international evangelist. He's written a number of books. Uh, he had been preaching at a service where he... Part of the service was a beautiful, beautiful anthem sung by a just marvelous choir. And after the service was over, Dr. Craddock went up to the choir room to congratulate them. And, and as he did, he ran into an elderly woman who was coming down. And she had just finished singing in the choir. And he commented on how beautiful and how lovely the music was. And the woman looked at him and she said, well, that's good, because that was it. I quit. And Dr. Craddock said, what do you mean, you quit? And she said, just what I said. I quit. And not just the choir, all of it. Church, Sunday school, committees, meetings, dinners. I quit. And he said, well, why in the world are you quitting? And she said, you know, I stand up here in the choir loft Sunday after Sunday and I look out at the congregation and I see people laughing, I see people talking, I see people visiting. Don't see anybody serious about serving the Lord and I quit. And Dr. Craddock said, why? Why do you want to quit? And she simply responded by, Dr. Craddock, who cares? Who cares whether I'm here or not? Who cares what good the Lord does here? Some of you who are football fans may remember the co one-time coach of the Houston Oilers, Bum Phillips. And he once made the following observation. He said, and I quote, there are two types of coaches in the National Football League, them that have been fired and them that's going to be fired. And there's probably some truth to some of that. This statement, I think, applies to our scripture lesson today because in our world today, there are two kinds of people. Those who have been hurt and those who are going to be hurt. And all of us fall into either one or both of those categories. You see, we can't escape it. We can't avoid it. And being a Christian doesn't give us an exemption from being hurt. I wish it did, but it doesn't. And I know, personally, that some of you here today are hurting. Relationships gone bad, physical ailments, financial hardships, spiritual darkness, loss of loved ones. Some of you are here today with hurts, and with pains that you have kept locked up in your heart for a long, long time, unwilling to share those 
or even reveal them to God. Many of us are completely unaware of that next hurt that's waiting right around the corner. It might be a week from now, it might be a month, or maybe even a year from now. But folks, it's going to happen. And when it does, you will be completely unprepared and you will be blindsided by what happens. But even though we experience those kinds of hurts, some of them very, very deep hurts, we don't have to lose hope. Even though sometimes the situations that we're in appear to be hopeless. But you know what? That's the way Satan wants it. He wants our lives to appear like there is no hope. That there is no hope for hurt or suffering or sorrow or grief or pain. What he doesn't want you to know is what our gospel lesson was about this morning, that Jesus offers hope for the hurting. And why is there hope when we hurt? Our scripture lesson from Luke gives us three reasons why there is hope when we hurt. But before I talk about that, very briefly, I want to examine the situation, the condition that this woman in our scripture lesson had. Verse 11, it says that she was crippled, bent over, and couldn't straighten up, and had been that way for 18 years. Now, I've got back problems. Very rarely do I get up in the morning that my back doesn't hurt. And when I go to see my doctor, we, we kind of have the same conversation back and forth, and she'll say, Chris, does your back hurt today? And I'll say, Dr. Mohammed, in all due respect, and again, don't ask me if it hurts. Ask me how much it hurts today. Maybe not as much as it did yesterday. And then she follows through with, well, are you taking your muscle relaxers and your anti-inflammatories? And I say, no, doctor, because my back doesn't hurt that much all the time, and I'm taking too much medicine anyway. And then she always responds with, well, you know that this is age-related. I said, I know what you're saying, Dr. Mohammed. That means there's not a darn thing you can do about it. Or me. Okay? And if life was left at that, there wouldn't be any hope. That's what Satan wants you to believe. That all of the pain and the suffering, whether it be physical or spiritual or financial or emotional or whatever it is that you're going through right now, he wants you to believe that there is no hope. There is no end. That where you are, you're going to be. And there's not going to be any changes. Well, that's probably how this woman felt. Can you imagine having your back causing you to be bent over for 18 years? Talk about no hope. My goodness. Well, medically, this was probably a condition that physicians now refer to as the Marie Strumpel disease. This is a, a fusion of the spinal bones, and early on in the course of the disease, the sufferer often finds relief from the pain if they will bend forward a little bit. It eases the pain. Well, when the person bends forward, the more they lean, the greater the spine fuses. To finally, they're in positions like this. Can you imagine living your whole life, walking around like this? Trying to live your life, bend over and over. That's how this woman was for 18 years. Mm, terrible disease. That the way that Jesus responded to her hurt is the way that we can expect him to respond to us when we hurt and to all hurting people today. And there is hope for everyone today who hurts. So, the three reasons why there is hope. First of all, Jesus notices and cares for hurting people. Scripture says, as Jesus was teaching in the synagogue, on the Sabbath, there was a woman who for 18 years had a sickness caused by a spirit. Notice that part. I'm going to get back to that. Caused by a spirit. Okay. And she was bent double and could not straighten up at all. And Jesus saw her and he called her over and said, woman, you are freed of your sickness. This unnamed woman unidentified, did not go unnoticed by Jesus. Now, if you read the scriptures, you'll notice that many 
of those whom Jesus helped in the Gospels were unnamed because it didn't matter who they were. Their name didn't matter. What did matter was that Jesus had an eye for those who hurt. And he reached out to her in the midst of her pain because he was aware of her pain just as he is aware of all the pains that we suffer in our lives. That's true. Jesus cares for all people, even you and me. But those who are hurting seem to receive special attention and special responses from Jesus. In the New Testament, look at the, the lineup. Not what you'd call the cream of the crop of, of civilization. Lepers, prostitutes, tax collectors, widows. They were the ones who were the most oppressed, the most ignored in biblical day, the most hopeless, the most who were hurting. Yet these were the very people who Jesus ministered to most often and most powerfully. Those who were nameless, those whom society would see sitting by the side of the road begging or in pain or crippled that they would walk past and ignore. Well, those were the people, the very people who Jesus had compassion for and reached out and touched and ministered to. Please don't ever think that Jesus is not aware of your situation. Now I know the, the oppressor, the devil, can make life seem like it's hopeless. Folks, been there, done that. Been there and done that, as many have of you. Don't think for a moment that Jesus is not aware of your pain. Nor don't think that he is not moved by your tears. Even though you may not understand many of the things that you're going through, or why your prayers sometimes seem to go unanswered. But be confident that God notices and cares about every pain. Every problem, every setback, every hurt in your life. And as his followers, those of us who profess to follow Christ, we have an obligation to do the same thing to others around us in our community and in our church and in our family. Because Jesus cared about those who were hurting, we also need to care about those who are hurting. That's the first thing. And then the second thing is Jesus is powerful enough to heal hurting people. Not just care about them, but to heal them. Jesus is not only compassionate, but is very powerful. He can heal your hurts. He can loose your bondages and change your situation if you will let him. If you are physically ill, Jesus can heal you. If you have a troubled relationship, Jesus can restore it. If your spirit, your spiritual life is in a mess, Jesus can fix it. There's nothing beyond the power of Jesus. Maybe you have suffered for many years like this woman in our scripture. Maybe you're not bent over. Maybe you're suffering some physical ailment, a spiritual ailment an emotional ailment, whatever it is. Maybe you've suffered like this woman for years and years, gone on and not said anything to anybody about it. You can still find hope and never give up because Jesus is powerful enough to heal your hurt. Scripture says, and when Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, woman, you are freed from your sickness. And he laid hands on her and immediately she was made erect again and began glorifying God. Can you imagine being in that much pain and that much suffering for 18 years and all of a sudden you can stand up straight. Instead of looking at people like this, you can look at people eye to eye again with no pain. My goodness, I think I would be glorifying God as well. I'd be doing handsprings, saying, thank you, Jesus. And finally, Jesus explains that 
Satan, the oppressor, not God, is the cause, much of the cause, for hurting people. Some of the typical questions that, that I get are, why is God putting me through this? Why did God give me cancer? Why did God take my child away from me? Why is God breaking my family apart? But in verse 16, Jesus explains, and this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan had bound for 18 years. Satan is responsible for this. Why should she not have been released from this bond on the Sabbath? Jesus performed a miracle here in front of these people. People that knew this woman knew her as the woman who was bent over. And all of a sudden, in their midst, she's standing erect. And what was their concern? Not that Jesus healed her, but that he did it on the Sabbath. You know, what better day to be healed from the Lord on his day? What better day? What better time to glorify God but on the Sabbath? Verse 11 tells us before this that Luke said, And behold, there was a woman who for 18 years had a sickness caused by a spirit. Well, it was an evil spirit. It was caused by Satan. Satan bound her, according to the scripture. You know, it's bad to blame God for all the bad things in life. Well, why is that? Why is that? When people come and talk to me, they don't say, why did Satan put me through this? Why did Satan give me cancer? Why did Satan break up my family? They don't say that. They say, why is God putting me through this? Why did God give me cancer? Well, you know, I'm, I'm not cancer-free yet. I can't say that yet. But I'm, I'm getting there. And through this whole ordeal, never one time did I ever say, God, why did you give me cancer? Because God didn't give me cancer. God doesn't cause bad things to happen in our lives. The Bible teaches us that Satan brought suffering and sorrow into the world through sin. We know that. But Jesus' ministry was spent healing and easing the suffering of those who were hurting. Jesus looked on death and disease as intruders into our lives. So the next time something bad happens to you, don't be so quick to blame God for what happened. It might be worth just asking yourself, could this be the work of Satan against me? And you know, I said this morning, when, when you stay uncommitted, you don't pose a threat to Satan. He doesn't care. When you make commitments and turns toward God, that Satan sees as a threat. And though he is not as powerful as God, he is more powerful than you and I, and he's going to disrupt your life. He's going to throw some things at you that tomorrow to make you quit make you throw on the towel and say, I can't do that. I can't be this person. I can't say this. That's the time that we need to realize that what Satan has caused, Satan has intended for evil against us, God will use for good. What, while Satan is against us, God is for us. So what should we do? It's very simple. Just as Christ showed compassion, we are to be compassionate because Christ has paved the way for us by showing us how to treat others. So I ask you this morning, how is your ministry? It all depends on how you have used the, the resources, the time, the money, the talents, the gifts, the possessions that God has blessed you with. Do you open those things out and share them with others or do you afford them? You know, I heard a story the other day about two men who were marooned on an island and the one man the first man kept saying we're going to die we don't have any food we don't have any water we're going to die and the second man just kind of sat back against the tree very leisurely and it irritated the first man and finally he said don't you care that we're going to die and his response was you know what 
I make a hundred thousand dollars a week. And the first man said, what does that matter? What good does that matter? So you make a hundred thousand dollars a week. We're still stranded here. And he said, you don't understand. I make a hundred thousand dollars a week and I give 10% of that to the church. We're going to be rescued. My pastor is going to find me. <laughs> well, you know what? When we're hurting and we are God's servants, God is going to find us. God is going to find you. He's going to seek you. Seek you out and find you and help you and heal your hurt. Now, our problem is we want it and we want it right now. And that's not always God's plan. God said, I'm going to heal you. Bear with me. Chris, I know that most people, when they have that surgery, are only catheterized two weeks. I'm going to catheterize you for six weeks. Okay. You deal with it. You do what you have to do. And know that all through it, as I said before, you don't go and tell God how big your problems are. You tell your problems how big your God is. And God will take care of it. That's what kept me going the whole time I was sitting at home, catheterized. That's what kept me going, knowing that God was going to take care of it. God has a purpose and God will fulfill it and take care of it. So I ask you, which side are you on? There are two kinds of people in this room today. Those who care for the hurting and those who don't want to. Are you hurting today? Do you, do you think that God doesn't care? And you know what? God knows about your cares. God knows about your hurts. And God does care. Remember the elderly woman that I spoke of earlier, the one who told Dr. Craddock that she was going to quit? And not just the, the choir, but all of it. And she, as she looked out at the congregation and she asked herself, who cares? And she determined that nobody did. Well, you know, Dr. Craddock responded to her by telling her, ma'am, you're wrong. You are wrong. I go to churches all over the country, all over the world, and I see people who care every day. I see people who care for one another, people who are kind, and share with one another and help their hurts. And she replied, really? All over? Name one. Just name one. And as Dr. Craddock, who was preaching this sermon to his congregation, or telling the story to a congregation, said to them, when he was speaking that day, I now ask you. Simple question in response. Her simple request to him was, name one, Dr. Craddock. Name one. And I ask you today, could you give her your name? When she said, who cares? Could you respond to her by saying, I do. God cares. And you know what? I do too. I care for you because God cares for me. I love you because God loves me. And I want to help you because God helps me. How much do you care? I guess that's the, the proper question to ask today. How much do you care? You know? How much do you care? Lord, we know that you are there, a constant source of strength and support and help and hope. And I pray that there, if there is, are those here today who are hurting, who feel like there is no end to it, that it's hopeless, that the situation is hopeless, that you will show them hope today. That whatever it takes, Lord, that you will bring to them that glimmer of hope to know that there is a light at the end of the tunnel, that they're not stumbling around in the darkness of despair by themselves. That you are there as a constant source of hope and strength and that you will lead them from the darkness back into the light. For this we ask, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our hymn of commitment this morning is number 593. Here I am, Lord. It kind of goes along with what I've been saying. Here I am, Lord. Use me. Let's stand and sing number 593. Here I am, Lord.
arms and say, Lord, here I am. It's I. I will go if you will lead me. I will hold your people. So I said before, as those who God loves, especially when you're hurting, especially when you're dealing with grief and suffering, and God is there all the time. I said before, as those who God, God loves, and cares for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.